All right. So, once again, happy Independence Day, everybody. Start, I want to start by asking a question. Um, how many countries have the 4th of July? Trick question. So, all of them do. Just not everybody has our Independence Day. So, it's very unusual that Independence Day falls on the 4th of July. I tried to Google this and find out how many times... Independence Day falls on a Sunday, but for some reason, Google, which seems to have all of the answers, couldn't answer that question, so I didn't want to do too much research on there. So, um, anyway, as a general rule, when I'm on Facebook, I try and avoid debates, but every once in a while, I kind of get sucked into some debate and it's kind of one of those you know it's like the glass that's starting to get spilled you just kind of watch it in slow motion and all of a sudden it happens well that's kind of what happened this last week and so I kind of normally when I do this I'm responding to a friend on Facebook who tends to be a little bit more politically left of center. Well, this time I kind of got into a back and forth with a friend who's more politically right of center than I am. There aren't too many that are there, but there are a few. And so we got in this back and forth about a meme that he had posted. And he was kind of surprised at my response. And he was talking about our need to go back to our founding principles to the principles of Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin. Well, for me, the solution can't begin there. I think we've gone beyond the point where starting with Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin is not enough. And my comment to this friend of mine is that our solution to what's going on in our country is not a matter of getting our laws right. Because what is fundamentally wrong with our country is a matter of the heart. So if we're going to go back into history, we have to look at what influenced Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin. And so you have to go back to the generation before that. So what took place the generation before our founders? It was something called the Great Awakening. So we have to go back not to the principles, this is what I argued with my friend, not to the principles of Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin, but to the principles of Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and John and Charles Wesley. Interestingly enough, one of the... Got a, somehow a video came up. <laughs> Just about the time I was going to bring my slide up. All right. So, interestingly, uh, one of the closest relationships in American history that often gets overlooked is a relationship, a friendship, that Benjamin Franklin had developed. Franklin was perhaps the foremost philosopher and scientist of his generation, certainly in the colonies, and he was well respected in Europe as well. And he had a tremendous influence on the writing of the Declaration of Independence and on the Constitution. But over the course of his life, he had developed a close friendship with George Whitfield. And they had had a number of correspondence. A lot of these correspondence still exist today. What I want to do is I want to take a moment and read a letter that George Whitfield had written to Benjamin Franklin. This was dated August 17th, 1752. And George Whitfield wrote this from London to Benjamin Franklin. He wrote, he wrote it to Benjamin Franklin. And this is what he says. Enclosed, you have a letter from Mr. R. Mr. R was probably James Reed, who had 
been doing something on behalf of Whitfield. I hope that, uh, Whitfield continues, I hope that promotion will do him no hurt. May God help him to make a stand against vice and profaneness and to exert his utmost efforts in promoting true religion and virtue. This is the whole of man. I find that you grow more and more famous in the learned world. As you have made a pretty considerable progress in the mysteries of electricity, I would now humbly recommend to your diligent, unprejudiced pursuit and study the mystery of the new birth. It is a most important, interesting study, and when mastered, will richly answer and repay you for all your pains. At one, or one at whose bar we are shortly to appear hath solemnly declared that without it, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You will excuse this freedom. I have, I must have, Aliquid Christi, which means some of Christ. I must have some of Christ in all my letters. I am yet a willing pilgrim for his great name's sake, and I trust a blessing attends my poor, feeble labors. To the giver of every good gift may be all the glory. My respects await your whole self and all inquiring friends and hope to see you yet once more in this land of the dying. I subscribed, I subscribe myself, dear sir, your affectionate friend and obliged servant, George Whitfield. For whatever we might think of the nature of the faith of our founding fathers, it is hard to deny the fact that the Great Awakening had a substantial impact in the colonies and it had a substantial impact on our founders as well. In the past several weeks, we have seen in a series in the narrative portion of the book of Daniel entitled Living Faithfully in a Foreign Land. We have seen that this, in this series that God honors those who put first things first. We have seen God display his sovereignty through impossible situations and rescue people from the, fiery, from the furnace of affliction. Last week, we witnessed how God humbles and restores even the mightiest who acknowledge his sovereignty as we saw God work through Nebuchadnezzar. Today, we turn our attention to yet another account of the display of God's sovereignty over the nations. So, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5, and now we can play the video. Marty. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. Now, while the king was drinking his wine, he gave orders, bring in the gold and silver goblets that my father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. <laughs> so they brought in the gold and silver goblets, that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank wine from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. And he became so frightened that his face turned deathly pale and his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. Then the king called out to the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought. And he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in. But they could not read the writing. Or tell the king what it meant. 
So the king became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. Now the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. Oh, king, live forever, she said. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your fathers, he was found to have insight and intelligence and outstanding wisdom like that of the gods. This man, Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and also the ability to interpret dreams and explain riddles and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel. He'll tell you what the writing means. <laughs> so Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you, Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king had brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that uh, no mystery is too big for you, and that you have the ability to interpret dreams, solve riddles, and explain difficult problems. <clears throat> the wise men of my king who were brought before me do read this writing and tell me what it means, but they cannot explain it. Now, I understand that you have uh, exceptional qualities. <clears throat> if you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you, the clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around your neck. And you will be proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel replied to the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king. Oh, king. The Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He ate grass like cattle. Seven times passed by for him until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kings of men. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. As you drank the wine, you praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone that cannot see or hear or walk. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mine, mine, tekel, apostin. This is what these words mean. Mine. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Afhasen, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is trustworthy and good. We thank you that in your word we see the faithfulness of, your, of servants like Daniel. Lord, we know that you are sovereign over all things, and I pray that as we seek to understand what you have for us in your word this morning, that you would open up our eyes, open up our ears, help us to understand the lessons from this text that we might come to a greater understanding of your sovereignty over all things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the title of this morning's sermon is 
the sovereign and the rejected. In the text, we see something that is very different from what we saw last week. In both Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, we see that God sovereignly humbles mighty kings. However, God deals with Belshazzar in a very different way than he deals with Nebuchadnezzar. From this chapter, we can learn this, that those who forget his sovereignty, God will reject. First point of this, the first point this morning is this, God's sovereignty risks being forgotten. Now, I'm not saying that God is somehow impotent, that somehow the risk of forgetting his sovereignty is due to some failure on God's part. Neither am I saying that God's sovereignty is not evident. David writes in Psalm 19, 1, the heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Paul tells us in Romans 1, verses 18 through 20, quote, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen through the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. The sovereignty of God is known but the sovereignty of God risks being forgotten. So what do we do, what do we do that causes us to risk forgetting the sovereignty of God? Notice that we forget by being indifferent to the risks around us. As chapter five opens, a significant amount of time has passed between chapters four and chapter five. Likely, it's 20 years or more that have transpired. In that time, a lot has happened. By this time, Nebuchadnezzar is no longer king. Nebuchadnezzar's son, evil Merodach, assumed the throne in his place, but ruled for only two years before being murdered by his brother-in-law, Neraglaser, who replaced him. Nereglaser ruled for four years before he died, and in turn, he was replaced by his son, Labashi Marduk. He ruled for only two months before being assassinated and, re and being replaced by Nabonidus, the one who sits on the throne of Babylon at this point is Belshazzar, the son of Nabonidus. Belshazzar is reigning as co-regent with his father, who historical sources say spent about two-thirds of his time away from Babylon. As the Babylonian Empire declined in the decades following Nebuchadnezzar's death, the Medo-Persian Empire grew stronger. Already, the Persian Empire had, had inflicted a number of significant defeats on the Babylonians, and by the time of the events of Daniel 5, the Persians were outside the walls of Babylon itself. Perhaps there was an air of overconfidence with Belshazzar. The walls of the city were considered unbreachable. The city had had access to enough water and food to last approximately 20 years, according to some sources. In the presence of the dangers facing him, Belshazzar decides to throw a massive celebration. He is seemingly indifferent to the dangers facing him. One of the evidences that 
we have forgotten God's sovereignty is that we are indifferent to the dangers that we face. Jesus warns in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, quote, For the coming of the Son of Man will be like in the days of Noah. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So it will be, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So how do we forget the sovereignty of God? First of all, we do so by being unaware of the dangers that are around us. More seriously, we forget the sovereignty of God by being irreverent toward God. Not only does Belshazzar plan a massive party, but he also does something that Nebuchadnezzar would never have done. He profaned something that was sacred by bringing the utensils of Solomon's temple to use in the drunken revelry and in celebration of their so-called gods. One commentator notes, quote, the fact that these had not, had not been melted down suggests that they had been preserved because of their sacred character. Since the God of Babylon was seen as the conqueror, the things that belonged to the conquered God would have been taken as booty to, into the temple of Marduk. Perhaps the use of the vessels was a way of calling to remembrance the God's previous victories, unquote. In an effort to allay the fears of the threats the Persians posed, and to insist and to instill confidence in the supreme power of his God, perhaps Belshazzar brings in the sacred vessels from Solomon's temple, items of gold and silver dedicated to the worship of Yahweh, the one true God. He is a glaring, his is a glaring act of irreverence, unlike anything displayed before him. So often we forget the sovereignty of God, and when we do so, we demonstrate a blatant lack of reverence to God. We turn instead to the things that we, can, that we think we can trust, we act in the physical realm in a way that betrays where our faith really lies. We hoard our resources. We turn to political leaders in hopes that the right person can turn things around. Our eyes remain fixed indelibly on the physical and the temporal rather than on the heavenly and the eternal. The things that should be committed to God, we commit to ourselves. When we forget the sovereignty of God, we demonstrate a lack of reverence for the things of God. Not only do we see that we forget by being indifferent to the dangers and, irre and irreverent to God, but we also forget God's sovereignty by being ignorant of his past actions. Now, God has revealed something in the presence of more than a thousand people. Belshazzar was likely quite inebriated at this time, and yet he sees on the, opposite, on the wall opposite to him a hand writing words in plaster illuminated by candlelight. So disturbed is he by what he sees that the text tells us his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. I think I've only been that nervous once in my life. As with chapters 2 and 4, when the king is confronted with 
disturb, with a disturbing revelation from God, he turns to the wise men to try to interpret and apply what he has seen. And as with chapters 2 and 4, the wise men are unable to make sense of what they have seen and heard. Even the promise of the third highest position in the kingdom, which is the highest position that Belshazzar could have granted since he was second to his father Nabonidus, even that was not enough to gain an interpretation of what had been written. The queen, likely the queen mother, who would have remembered what had happened with Nebuchadnezzar, comes in and reminds Belshazzar about Daniel, who had been so influential in the, in the interpreting of dreams and mysteries for Nebuchadnezzar. So, Belshazzar sends for Daniel. What we see from Daniel is a very different response to Belshazzar than what we see to Nebuchadnezzar. Not only does Daniel reject the gifts that Belshazzar is offering, but he addresses the king in a decidedly uncourtly manner. Daniel is not, not at all concerned about what the outcome of this mystery may mean for Belshazzar. He evidently has no respect for the king the way that he did with Belshazzar. What we see in Daniel's response to Belshazzar before he even gets to the interpretation of what had been written is a rebuke that the king had forgotten the lessons that had been demonstrated through Nebuchadnezzar. Although Nebuchadnezzar had humbled himself and worshipped the Most High God, da Daniel says to Belshazzar in verses 22 and 23, he says this, Yet you, his son, which is, could potentially be a reference not to his biological son, but he's following in the kingly line, Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have exalted yourself against the God of heaven, and they have brought vessel, the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines have been drinking from them, and you have praised the, God of silver, the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand, but the God in whose hand are your life, breath, and all your ways, you have not glorified. The handwriting on the wall was God's indictment of Belshazzar for his pride, forgetting that God sovereignly rules over all. Again, as we look throughout Scripture, this pattern repeats itself. God does a mighty work in an individual or a people through either divine judgment or miraculous deliverance, and the people remember it for a while. However, the generation, a generation arises that does not acknowledge God and has forgotten his past actions. Rather than seeing God as sovereign, this new generation seeks to find sovereignty in itself and its understanding. Time and again throughout the Old Testament, the history of God's judgment and deliverance of Israel is recounted. Her people are called to remember the great things of God, yet time and time again, the people forget. When we fail to remember the past, the result is worse than the fact that we would be doomed to repeat it. When we fail to remember the past, it isn't simply that we forget to recall facts, dates, people, and events. 
What we should look to the past to understand is where God was sovereignly working. We should look to see God's hand in those events and in those people. So often I fear that we are guilty of what I call generational myopia. We look at our generation and think we are either the ones who did things correctly or we are the ones who will do things correctly. The problem, I think, is that the generations, is that we, is with the generations either before us or the generations after us. Those are the problems, but not our generation. We don't see that God has worked in each and every generation displaying both his sovereign grace and his sovereign judgment. In Daniel, 34, in Daniel 4, verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged of God, quote, his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Each generation is called to acknowledge God's sovereignty, but each generation is in danger of forgetting it. God's sovereignty risks being forgotten, and our generation is just as in danger of forgetting as any. Daniel spent most of his time responding to Belshazzar by chastising him for willfully forgetting God's sovereignty that had been displayed through Nebuchadnezzar. He spent more time doing that than he did interpreting what had been written on the wall. Now at last, he turns his attention to the handwriting on the wall. That's interesting. We use that term in our culture. I wonder how many people who use that phrase, the handwriting on the wall, understand where it comes from. It's context. It's application. The inscription on the wall foreshadowed judgment for the king. Daniel expresses little reservation in sharing this meaning. The words scrawled in plaster had confused the men, the wise men of the court. Even though they understood Aramaic and that's what had been written on the wall, the words and their significance meant little to them. Because these were written by God, only someone whom God determined could understand and interpret these words. So Daniel relates the, word in their, the words and in their interpretation. Mine, mine, tekel, uparsen. These were the words that were written on the, on the wall. One commentator notes, quote, Mine or Mene is an Aramaic noun referring to a weight of 50 shekels, a mina equal to one and a quarter pounds. From the verb mina to refer to, num can mean to number or to recount. Tekel, or tekel, is the noun referring to a shekel, which is two-fifths of an ounce. It is from the verb tekal, meaning to weigh. Parson, or uparson in the New American Standard, can, be, can also mean parsin, can be pronounced parsin, and it is a noun meaning a half mina, or 25 shekels, or about two-thirds of a pound. It is from the verb paras, meaning to break or to divide, unquote. Daniel tells Belshazzar in summary, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. You have been weighed on the scales and found deficient, therefore, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Each one of these statements involves a wordplay for the words that appeared on the wall. 
God had assessed the nature of the kingdom and the king. It's easy for us to be harsh in our judgment of a man like Belshazzar and Daniel in communicating the message of judgment to the king is being harsh. During a time when the king felt secure in his position, the city seemingly unconquerable, he became overwhelmed with pride in his gods and had forgotten the lessons from Nebuchadnezzar. He had engaged in behaviors that flaunted the sovereignty of God, and now he would be judged for those behaviors. So lest we forget that we are immune, Jesus tells us that each one of us will be held accountable for the very words that we speak. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37 Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. To the Pharisees, Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruits good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I mentioned in the Father's Day message couple of weeks ago, that our behavior matters. It matters to God. Christ, when Christ came, he came not only to save the world, but also to judge it. He bore witness to the holiness of God. He lived the perfect sinless life that we could not live. And he took the judgment that was rightly ours. His righteous behavior is credited to the account of those who confess their sins and believe in Jesus' name. Recall what Jesus says in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 verses 18 to 21. Jesus says this. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in himself. Wait a minute, that's not what Jesus said. He said, as having been wrought in God. God brings life to those who repent and believe. But God also brings judgment on those who refuse to repent and believe. God acts sovereignly through nations. And this is a fact that our founding fathers acknowledged. And they did so regularly. In the introduction to my message, I referenced a much overlooked friendship, the friendship between George Whitfield and Benjamin Franklin. As I bring this message to a close on this independent study, I want to read a speech that Franklin gave on the floor of the Constitutional Convention. 
The delegates were making little headway in their efforts to draft a replacement for the Articles of Confederation, and it seemed likely that their efforts would be doomed to fail. On Thursday, June 28, 1787, Dr. Franklin stood up on the floor at the convention and said the following. Mr. President, the small progress we have made after four or five weeks, close attendance and continual reasonings with each other, our different sentiments on almost every question, several of the last producing many no's, as many no's as a's, it, methinks, a melancholy proof of the imperfection of the human understanding. We indeed seem to feel our own want of political wisdom since we have been running about in a search of it. We have gone back to ancient history for models of government and examined the different forms of those republics which, having been formed with the seeds of their own disillusion, now no longer exist. And we have viewed modern states all around Europe but find none of their constitutions suitable to our circumstances. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have, hither, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illumine our understandings? In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, we were, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for the divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent incidents of a superintending providence in our behavior, or in our favor. To that kind providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national felicity. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have, sir, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more con convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of man. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build, except the Lord build they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders, than the builders of Babel. We have divided, we shall be divided by our little partial local interests. Our projects will be confounded and we ourselves shall become a reproach and a byword down to future age. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing governments by human wisdom and leave it to chance, war, and conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and the blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business and that one or more of the clergy of this city be requested to officiate that service." Unquote. While it is doubtful that Benjamin Franklin was a Christian, at a minimum, he acknowledged something that Belshazzar did not. 
he acknowledged that in some active manner, God governs in the affairs of men. For us, it is not sufficient to give intellectual assent to this truth. God's sovereignty must bring us to the point of repentance, resulting both in a change of belief and in a change of behavior. If we do not, those who forget his sovereignty, the Lord will reject. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray for our nation. I know that as we look back throughout our history, we have in fact seen, as Franklin mentioned, multiple incidents of you intervening on our behalf. But God, I fear that we have forgotten you. Nor is this an issue merely on a national level, but so often personally, we forget you. We get caught up in the busyness of our lives. We get caught up in our own ease. We get caught up in the confidence in our own abilities and the comforts of our own time. And by our neglect, we forget you. We forget that you are sovereign. God, I pray that you would forgive us of our sins, both individually and collectively. God, I pray that you would transform our hearts, that you would bring us individually and collectively to a point of repentance before you. God, I pray that we would daily, humbly acknowledge your sovereignty over our lives. Lord, we know that in the end times, that there will be a great falling away. But Lord, I pray that we would be defined as people who humbly seek your face, who humbly acknowledge your sovereignty, so that whether times get better or times get worse, that we would trust that you are in it, that we would trust our times to you. God, I pray that the people in this community would find in us a people who acknowledge your sovereignty over us individually, over our community, that in your sovereignty that we would exhibit a peace that surpasses all understanding, that that would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Ground us in this truth that you govern in the affairs of men. And may we seek your face. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.